Good morning and welcome to our Lim Baptist Church Sunday morning service. It's great to have you joining with us wherever you're joining us from this morning. And also today, it's a real privilege to have our regional minister, Phil Jump, as our guest speaker. And we'll be really looking forward to Phil opening up God's word to us a little bit later on. And we have the prayer phone available. So if you do want to text in prayers um, to us today, then please do. Somebody from the prayer team will have the phone and the number is available on the screen so you can do that. In a moment, we're going to be hearing some words from Psalm 86 as we sort of gather ourselves together to worship the Lord. But I'm going to ask Claire if she just lead us in prayer ahead of that song. Yeah, would you like to bow your heads with us? Father, we just thank you for a new day. We thank you for a new opportunity to come and to worship you from our homes, wherever we are, wherever we are watching from. Father, would you just um, help us to gather and to worship you in the best way that we can, in the best way that we can in our current situation. Lord, we long to meet together again. We long for things to be uh, a little bit back to normal, but we just pray, Spirit of God, that you will just be with us, that we will encounter you, we will be changed by you. And so that everybody in this service that is taking part, Lord, would you speak to us, change us, and help us to focus our attention on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear our cry, O Lord, our hearts are needy. Guard the lives of those who are faithful. You are our God, have mercy, Lord. We will constantly call upon your name. You, O oh Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear our prayer and listen to our cry for mercy. There is none like you, O oh Lord. No deeds compare with yours. Every nation joins in worship of you, each bringing glory to your name. For you are great, your deeds are marvellous, you alone are God. i 
Hi, um, you were telling us at staff meeting the other day, Jonathan, that you've been reading a couple of books written about the coronavirus, and I was just hoping you could share that with us. Yeah, so uh, I think the first thing that amazes me is that people have actually had books um, written and then published in such a short space of time. But these are two books. Um, this one, if you can see it, is by John Lennox. It's called Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Um, a number of you I know will have seen John Lennox at the Par Hall a couple of years back with an event that Church Warrington put on. And then this book, which is a slightly thicker book than the other one, this is called God and the Pandemic. I don't know if you can see that. Is that in focus now, Sam? Yes. Um, yeah. That's by um, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, as he um, sometimes is known. Okay. And, and could you give us an outline of, of their style or what's it in each book? So the John Lennox book, the, the slightly shorter one, I mean, John Lennox is an incredibly clever bloke. He's a, he's a scientist, he's a professor, he's um, a deeply committed Christian, and, and he sort of grapples with all kinds of issues about um, what the virus shows us about our mortality, what it talks to us about a God of love, how we respond as Christians to, to, to those sort of things. Um, the Tom Wright book, this, this one with the, the spotty cover, um, this one really reflects on a, on a biblical basis and takes us through the Old Testament, the New Testament. A lot of what Tom Wright talks about is based on Acts chapter 11, um, where in Acts chapter 11, there are some prophets who come down from Antioch to Jerusalem to warn of a famine. And the response of the church is simply to say, well, who can we send and how can we help? And he goes through those sort of questions, you know, as churches, as Christians, who can we help and how can we respond? So that's a very different ways, but yeah. complementary ways of looking, I think, at the, the same situation. And uh, what would you recommend? Which one would you recommend? Well, I'd recommend them both, to be honest. <laughs> I, think, I think they're both um, equ equally good and valuable, but written from very different sort of points of view. Um, neither of them are particularly expensive. Both are available on Eden Christian Bookshop. You can order them online. So if you do want something to read over the summer, whether you're getting to go on holiday or whether you're not, they're not light, it's not a light read, um, obviously because of the, the subject matter, but they're really poignant in terms of getting us thinking. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'm sure Thanks, we'll, uh, 
<laughs> yep, get that ordered. <laughs> See you soon. Take care, thank you. This is a reading from Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. So thanks, Brian, for that reading. Just in case you have been really observant and were joining us last week, you may be thinking, why have we had that reading two weeks on the run? There is a reason for it, and that's that Phil will be speaking from that passage and another passage in Acts a little bit later on. Yeah, so we're now going to sing our next song together. Why don't you join with us? This is In Christ Alone.
Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful day. Thank you for our families and all that you bless us with. We praise you, Lord. Among all that we have, there are many people hurting and in need. We lift them to you now and ask that you would bless them, help them and heal them. Lord, we lift John and Lizzie's son Adam to you now. We thank you for getting him home from hospital. And we ask for you to continue your healing and for a full recovery. If you would now like to say your own prayers for those who you know are ill or in need, we will now have a few moments of quiet to lift those names to God. We ask that you intercede for them, fulfilling their needs according to your will. We also pray that you would use us to help them in any way we can. May your peace fill their hearts and may joy shine. We pray for our world, Lord, in this ongoing time of crisis. As our own country continues to see change and upheaval due to COVID-19, we ask for you to be with all those affected by the situation. We ask your hand to be upon all those key workers who have had many months of stress, but still don't know what the future holds. Give them strength to continue to fight, Lord, to help those who need their support. To those who have lost loved ones or who have been adversely affected by the pandemic, we ask your hand to be upon them to help them to repair their lives and give them hope for the future through your Holy Spirit. We play for our local community here in Lynn and Warrington. We ask that you continue to support all the various groups which the community needs and yet which are unable to function in the normal way. We also pray for our community to come to know you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work in our homes and neighbourhoods that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. We pray for our church leadership at Lynn Baptist Church while they are currently taking a well-deserved summer break. We pray that they are able to take time for rest, relaxation and to spend time in your presence so that they return to us ready to continue their service in your name. Open our eyes, Lord and make us aware of the opportunities we have to bless others in need. Help us not to be selfish and help us to share. All that we have is yours and we surrender to you. We commit these prayers to you in Jesus' name. We would like to finish our prayer time by praying the Apostle Paul's beautiful prayer for spiritual strength from Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So our second reading this morning is from the book of Acts, and this is Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through to 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they read their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. 
They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke boldly the word of God. Let's pray for Phil as he brings God's word to us from that passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Phil, just thank you for his ministry. And we just pray now as he opens your word, that the words that he speaks will speak into our hearts, that the words that he brings will challenge our situations. Lord, that you will encourage us, like the early church did, to speak your word with boldness. So open our hearts to receive, we pray. Holy Spirit, enable us to hear what it is you would say to the church this morning. Amen. Well, welcome to the third in this series of sermons, which I'm calling How Do We Sing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land? And of course, while many of us have hardly strayed from home in the last three months, we are indeed in a strange land in that the familiar places in which we find ourselves have become very, very different. And that's partly, it seems, because we're increasingly recognising that some of the restrictions and the changes of habit that uh, have been forced upon us that I think most of us imagined were going to be around for a matter of weeks look as if they're going to be around for a lot longer than that. But also, I think it's becoming a strange land because recent events have changed us. They've changed the people we are. Some of us, they've challenged and changed our understanding of church and our society is changing, which, of course, causes us as God's people to ask the question, well, what type of church is needed in this new normal as it's coming to be described? Now, these are really good questions to ask. In fact, I think they are essential questions to be asking. But I sense that they are questions that we need to ask with an awareness of what the church is and whose people it is that we are. I've noticed in recent weeks, I guess through recent experiences, just how much of the biblical narratives are set against a backdrop of transition. And of course, it's one of those moments of transition when the settled people of Judah were invaded and taken into exile that becomes the context for these words. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But it seems to me that the psalm writers, having asked that question, then made the mistake of looking to themselves for an answer to it instead of looking to God who, according to their contemporary prophets, had a somewhat different agenda to theirs. And so we might rightly ask questions about our own calling in the midst of this new normal. But it seems that we need to do so and also be careful to look in the right places for the answer to them. You know, let's remember that when Jesus announced to his disciples that the church was going to come into being, he did so by declaring, I will build my church, not go off and build a church of your own design, not even go out and build the church that the people around you want or build a church that you seem, think fits best into whatever new normal emerges. And time and time again in the New Testament epistles, this centrality of Christ in the building of the church is a defining feature of the narrative. He is the head of the body, the church, Paul reminds the Christians of Colossae. As you come to him, the living stone, says one Peter, you are being built into a spiritual house. And those New Testament writers were really only echoing what they learned from the old Unless the Lord builds the house, argues the psalm writer in a slightly more helpful mode, its builders labour in vain. And that's why in this third talk, I particularly want to focus on the prayer life of the early church. Now, we already know from Acts chapter two that the early believers were devoted to prayer. But I want to explore that a little bit further and ask, well, what kind of prayers did they pray? What did it mean to them when the New Testament writers spoke of them being devoted to prayer? 
Now that's a big subject, which is why we've been looking at one particular instance of prayer that is recorded for us in our reading in the book of Acts in chapter four. And it's a moment of gathering just after the early believers begin to realise that life might well be difficult for them in this new and emerging world of Christian faith. You know, they would have been all too aware of what happened to Jesus when he was in Jerusalem. But since the coming of the Holy Spirit, things had actually gone reasonably well for them. Peter's bold sermon on the day of Pentecost had been really well received. Thousands thronged to join their community. They lived and shared together in this rich life of community and they were keen to engage with the stories of Jesus. And, and so their life went on. And then one day as Peter and John are making their way to the temple to pray, they decide to take Jesus at his word. Jesus who had said, you will do greater works even than mine. And so they pronounce healing on a lame beggar who immediately rises to his feet and walks. Now events like that do not happen without people taking notice. And so the whole episode creates something of a commotion. And it would seem that the early believers who had so far managed to operate underneath the radar of the powers that be suddenly come to their attention. And Peter and John are summoned before the religious courts. Now, Peter at this moment does not mince his words. And he pretty clearly accuses the religious leaders of putting the son of God to death. And not surprisingly, they're pretty outraged by that. And so we reach the point of a standoff. You carry on doing the things you're doing. You carry on saying the things you're saying. And we will come down on you hard, say the religious authorities. Or as we might say in our modern parlance, they were released with a caution. So how would you pray if you were faced with that situation? How would you pray if you'd pretty much been told that if you don't keep your heads down and your mouth shut, if you don't stop witnessing the miraculous healing of strangers, you are in for some serious opposition? Now, I guess that my instinct would be firstly to pray, Lord, please make this problem go away. Make the leaders more kindly disposed to us or get rid of our current leaders and send us new ones. We don't really mind how you do it, but just, Lord, please sort this out for us. And then maybe we might also pray, well, if you can't get rid of the problem, help us to work around it. Enable your servants to speak your message in ways that doesn't attract too much attention or perhaps we might not pray at all. We might just do a risk assessment and decide that in future members of the early church should not engage in public healings because of the unnecessary risks that are involved. All of which are perfectly reasonable responses in our 21st century world. But that's not how the early Christians prayed. And as I reflect on this prayer that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 4, it does strike me that those early believers had come a long way from the people who gathered around Jesus on the day of his ascension and asked when he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. You see, what lay behind that question was, well, when are you going to hand the reins of power to the likes of us, Jesus, so that we can create an environment where we don't have to face the kind of opposition and persecution that you had to face? And Jesus had said to them on that occasion, you will get the power you need. But it won't be the power to control the environment. It will be the power to withstand that environment. It will be the power to be faithful witnesses in the midst of that environment. And it seems that that is exactly how they prayed. Like I said, they seem to have come a long way since Ascension Day. And the fact that the writer of Acts has gone to the trouble of recording and writing down this prayer and including in it what is a including it in what is a relatively brief account of the comings and goings of the early church suggests to me that we're supposed to see this church this prayer as significant so let's just take a look at what it has to say and how it's been framed first of all they placed their situation within the purposes of God. They looked at their situation from the perspective of the purposes of God. Praying was partly about helping them to see their situation through God's eyes. They didn't ask God to rethink his purposes. 
And I think there's something significant in that because I sense that the dynamic of many of the prayers that I hear, if I'm honest, today are largely prayers that have worked out God's purposes for him and are employing God to deliver on the solutions that we've already devised on God's behalf. Now, perhaps I'm being unfair. I don't know. But what I can say is that here in the pages of Acts, we see a model for prayer that is very much about aligning our own experience with the purposes of God, not asking God to steer his purposes in our direction. And if God is the builder of the church, then we need to be a church that is listening for God's direction. We need to be a church that is looking to God to shape us, not asking God to fit in with our plans. And as they reflected on the purposes of God, so they not only remembered what Jesus had told them on the day of his ascension, but they remembered some of the things that were recorded in the Old Testament, which they were increasingly coming to recognise as referring to Jesus. And they remembered what was written in Psalm 2. Those like kings and rulers who are concerned with their earthly power and position will rise up against God's anointed. And so if God has anointed us with his Holy Spirit, we will not be popular with the powers that be. We will not be popular with people for whom power matters. And so they recognised that they were experiencing what Jesus experienced. And they also recognised that tragic and cruel as it was, this was all part and parcel of the deeper purposes of God. And so they acknowledged that if they were going to speak with boldness, they would attract the opposition that was already being threatened. But even in this adversity and struggle, they recognised that God's purposes could not be thwarted. God's purposes could not be thwarted by the powers that be speaking out their threats against God's people. And God's purposes could not be thwarted by God's people asking God to change them. So what did they pray for next? Well, if speaking boldly meant persecution and threat, they prayed that God would enable them to speak boldly. And they did not pray that they might speak boldly for the sake of speaking boldly. This wasn't some masochistic prayer of bring it on. But they prayed that they might speak God's word boldly. Time and time again, Jesus had emphasised that their calling was to make his message known. You will be my witnesses, he said, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Jesus had spoken of the work of the Spirit in exactly these terms. When the Spirit comes, he told his followers on the night before he died, he will guide you in truth. The Spirit will make me known. The Spirit will reveal what is right and what is wrong. The church that is truly filled with the Spirit of God is a proclaiming church. And those early believers realised that in their context, if they were to speak the message of God with clarity and boldness, then it would most likely lead to persecution and opposition. And I find it fascinating that when they prayed, they didn't even mention their opponents in their prayers. They didn't pray for the problem to go away. They prayed for the courage to face it. They pray for themselves, but not in a selfish way, but in a way that reflects their absolute commitment to make the message of Jesus known. Lord, do whatever it takes. Help us to be willing to accept whatever it costs. Give us the strength to bear whatever it entails in order to make sure that we do not give up on proclaiming your message. That is how they pray. So stretch out your hand to perform signs and wonders, not for our benefit because it is likely to cost us. And of course, just a few chapters later, they were to discover the full extent of that cost as the newly appointed Stephen was stoned to death. But stretch out your hand, they pray, to perform signs and wonders so that your message can continue to be witnessed and shared. And so they prayed. And as they prayed, God responded. The place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. So I want to suggest that we need to not simply be a church that is devoted to prayer, 
but a church that is devoted to praying in the way that the early believers prayed. And I would argue that this particular prayer, perhaps here we have a framework for working out the answer to that question that I posed earlier. What kind of church is God calling us to be? And through this prayer, I sense that we see God is calling us to be a church that is rooted in God's purposes. Not that it's phased by changing circumstances or feels that its only future is to remain what it's always been. But a church that is committed to working out and serving God's purposes in whatever context it finds itself. And like those early believers, we may need to reread our scriptures and to re-embrace the words of Jesus to work out what it means to serve those purposes in whatever new world emerges around us. And we need to be a church that is proclaiming the message of Jesus with clarity and boldness. And yes, there are circumstances in which that will be difficult. There will be those who will seek to oppose us at every turn. But our prayer in the face of that is not necessarily that circumstances will change back or work to our advantage, but that God will give us the power that we need, that God will work in ways to affirm our message, that God will enable us to rise to the task. And it is because of that and alongside that, that thirdly, we need to be a church that is filled with the Spirit of God. As they prayed, they were filled again with the Spirit, the Spirit who dramatically came on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit who led them into a life of selfless discipleship, their instinct as events took a new turn and new normals began to emerge was to seek the anointing of the spirit afresh to equip them for whatever they faced. That's the kind of church that those early believers prayed to be. And that's the kind of church I hope we might also want to pray for God to make us into. So whatever new normal turns out to mean, we, as God's people, are not thrown into turmoil by it, but we simply are called to allow God to continue to work through us in it, to help us be a church that is rooted in God's purposes, that is committed to proclaiming God's message, and that is filled with God's spirit. Thanks, Phil, so much for what I felt was a really challenging and poignant message to us as a church at this time. And just as we come and just pray after what Phil has brought, um, those last words in that passage from Acts, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I wonder this morning, actually, wherever we are, whether that just needs to be our prayer, that we are filled and refreshed again by the Holy Spirit. As we go into this autumn term, into what will be many unknown situations, that the Holy Spirit would just come and equip us to serve God in whatever lies ahead. So perhaps you join me in praying that prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, as we've heard your word this morning, as we've heard about the early church and their desire both to be filled by you and to serve you, we just pray that we would be people who would want the same. So we pray, Holy Spirit, for that fresh anointing we pray for a fresh boldness in both living out and speaking out our faith in you. And we pray that just like the early church saw people added to their number daily, those who were being saved, that that might be our testimony, that might be our story. So Holy Spirit, even in the stillness now, would you come? Would you equip us? Would you anoint us, we pray? Just leave just a moment of, of quietness. Perhaps where you are, you just need to you may want to just sit and, and ask the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you now. So just in the stillness, let's just leave a moment to do that. Lord, give us that boldness and that confidence in your word, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And we're now going to sing our next song together, which is Holy Overshadowing. Shadow. 
which will I seek but God alone? No hiding place save only at your throne. Only the cross, the blood to wash my sin. Please do remember that if you'd like to join us on Tuesday evening again, we have another Tuesday stream service that it would be amazing if you can come out and join us for that. Just go and contact the office and they can book you on as normal. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. So we're going to bring our time together to a close and I'm going to pray for us. Let's pray. I just want to reiterate that prayer from a, a few moments ago. Lord, would you fill us? Would you send us out? Would you equip us and would you help us? to speak your word boldly. Thank you for all we've heard this morning. Thank you for all we've sung. Thank you for your presence with us. And we just pray that this will have equipped us to be your hands and feet this week, to shine your light into the darkness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us. It's been great to have you with us and we will see you next week. Yeah, bye.